Hello, and thanks for visiting. When I was teaching advanced lathe programs at the American Watchmakers Institute, it was customary for students to bring their own lathes to the classes. This was a great idea in some ways, since they became more acquainted with their own tools. But it was a nightmare for the instructors, as so many of the lathes were in poor condition, we spent far too much time fixing problems and getting everyone on the same page. I'm your host, Ron DeCourt, and these videos are my reply to those issues. Maybe you're looking to buy a lathe and don't have much experience, or possibly you own a lathe or two and want to expand your knowledge base. There are many different lathes associated with watchmaking. In this chapter, we'll focus on the WW, Webster Whitcomb style lathes, which are so popular worldwide. In upcoming chapters, we'll do some basic turning, examine tool geometry, turn a balance staff, repivot a fourth wheel, and in the process, get acquainted with the Jeco and Geneva lathes. The prismatic profile of the WW lathe bed was an important advancement and gained great popularity with watch manufacturing in the late 19th century. These lathes could accept a vast array of accessories for every conceivable manufacturing challenge and soon found a place at the watchmaker's bench, where many reside to this day. Typical WW lathes have a headstock for holding and turning the work and a tailstock for holding centers and other tooling. 8mm became the most popular spindle size for these small lathes, and measuring from the top of the lathe bed to the center line of the spindle is 50 millimeters. Headstocks are the heart of the lathe. They must rotate smoothly and concentrically. While some WW headstocks use ball or roller bearings, the vast majority use plane bearings to suspend the spindle in the headstock. Check the bearings by gently turning the spindle and take notice of any tightness. Don't force things. If the spindle seems a bit tight or rough, put some oil in the oil cups and let the head sit for a while and try again. If the tightness persists, an internal inspection is the next step. First, remove all external parts. In order to remove the spindle from the head, the spindle locking nut is removed. A screwdriver can be used to loosen, and don't forget to remove the pulley screw. Use a soft hammer and gently tap the spindle until it's free. Once disassembled, the parts can be cleaned in a bath of mineral spirits. With the spindle removed, the bearing diameters can be inspected and pay attention to three features of the spindle. At the tail end is the bearing keyway. In the middle is a flat for the pulley screw and near the head is a locating pin that protrudes into the spindle bore which aligns the collet keyway. The fact that these three features are in line will be helpful during the reassembly process. When reinstalling the spindle in the head, it should be lubricated in advance. Use spindle oil for the front bearing. Anti-seize grease works well for the rear bearing during the reinstall process. Thread the spindle through the head and pulley, not forgetting the belt, and slide the rear bearing onto the spindle paying attention to engage the locating pin of the bearing and the keyway in the spindle. Don't tighten the pulley screw yet. If the rear bearing needs a bit of help, use a piece of wood with a suitable hole and gently tap the bearing into place with a soft hammer. Install the bearing lock nut until it's tight and the spindle is locked in place and won't turn. Use a marking pen and make a line across the bearing and nut. Fill the oil cups with spindle oil and loosen the lock nut until the spindle is easily rotated. Reinstall the exterior hardware and tighten the pulley screw. Mount the head on the bed and run the spindle at low speed until the spindle rotates freely with absolute minimum end shake. Tapping the spindle at the ends with a soft hammer will help seat the bearings. Use the blue marker line as a reference when adjusting the bearing tension. Split chucks, or collets, being an integral part of the lathe spindle, are just as important in terms of accurate turning. A collet that fits poorly in the spindle bore, or is not concentric, isn't worth much. Two distinct styles are most common. 
the American style top, and the European B8 below. The two styles are somewhat interchangeable. In order that the spindle collet combination functions accurately, they must fit together like a glove. The central collet diameter should measure 8 millimeters, plus zero, and minus about one one hundredth of a millimeter. And the spindle bore should measure 8 millimeters, plus one one hundredth, and minus zero. Use a small hole gauge to check the diameter of the spindle bore. A good B8 collet measuring 7.99 millimeters, and a few examples of American style collets from three different well-known manufacturers reveals less than ideal sizing, and wear is not a factor in these results. Thread size for a B8 collet is 6.82 by 0.625 millimeter, but once again there are many variations, past and present, that vary enough to cause compatibility issues with different drawbars. The collet keyway and the locating pin, which protrudes into the spindle bore, is another issue of compatibility. If there's an issue of interference, the best remedy is to replace the existing pin, which involves driving out the old pin and turning a new one. My personal recommendation regarding collets or any other collet tooling, proceed with caution. This 8mm collet holding tailstock has a micrometer depth adjustment and in my opinion is the most versatile for this type of lathe, especially for small repivoting work. The micrometer thimble is graduated to 1 100th millimeter divisions. Proper alignment of the headstock spindle and tailstock quill are imperative for micro drilling. Checking alignment with centers is a good place to start, but drilling small holes is the truest test. Adding a cross slide to the WW lathe is a powerful combination. This is what the WW lathe was meant to be. Versatile, strong, and accurate. Cross slide lead screws are usually either half millimeter or one millimeter pitch and markings on the thimbles are 0 through 50 and 0 through 100 respectively. In other words, one turn of the half millimeter pitch screw moves the slide one half millimeter. And likewise, the one millimeter pitch screw moves the slide one millimeter. One one hundredth millimeter divisions are the norm. Traditional lantern type tool posts work well, but have been surpassed by block style and quick change posts, making for easier realignment when changing or sharpening tooling. Small, Quick change tool posts offer a lot of versatility and are worth the investment. Occasionally the slide should be disassembled and cleaned thoroughly in mineral spirits. Remove the lead screws, loosen the gib screws, and slide the saddles apart. After cleaning, use a fine Arkansas stone and gently touch off all bearing surfaces. While reassembling, grease the lead screw threads and underside of the rotational platform, and oil all bearing surfaces. Once reassembled, tighten the gib screws until the slides move freely over the full length of the lead screw end to end, with no side shake in the slides. Additional adjustments will be needed until the bearing surfaces have reseated themselves, and oil the slides frequently. Thanks again for the visit. Next up in this series, we'll focus on turning, drilling, and repivoting. And please don't forget to subscribe or bookmark this page. Until next time.